Thank you for joining me to talk about bacterial cell structure. This semester, we are going to be staining and looking at many microorganisms, many bacteria under the microscope. And when we do so, they're going to look like this picture here, where you can see that they are so tiny, even with a microscope, that we have no prayer of understanding the nuances of their cellular structure unless we were to zoom in even further. So come with me on a journey to look even further at the cellular structure of the bacterial and archaeal cells, but also to think about holistically where these organisms fit into the whole scope of the domains of life. We want to begin by looking at the three domains of life. There, are, there of course, is that which we are most familiar with, the eukarya. We are like the fungi and the proteists, and actually, I'm going to jot that down. So, the eukaryotic world, of course, encompasses us, <laughs> but it also encompasses a lot of microorganisms. Um, the microorganisms that are a part of the eukaryotic world are the fungi and also the proteists. So if we were to divide it into two major microbial categories, we would have the fungi and the proteists. And then it's cool to note that these two categories can be further broken down. So which within the, the fungal world, the, the fun guys among us, um, we have the yeast and the molds. And then the proteins could also be further split into the algae, quote unquote, and the protozoa. Now, the reason that I say quote unquote for these um, is because phylogenetically, which means based upon DNA sequences, these are not really legitimate groups. However, when we think about one being the uh, light using photosynthetic protease versus one being the eaters, the consumers that eat and chow down on other life, we split them into those two groups by, by that, for that reason. We'll talk more about that later, but this gives us the rough idea of the kinds of microorganisms that fit into the eukaryotic domain of life, the domain eukarya. Now, there are two other domains of life, the archaea and the bacteria. The archaea, rightly so, are their own do their own domain, they have characteristics of both bacteria and eukarya. Now, by all right, bacteria are the dominant form of life on Earth. Now, I know, wait, check that. <laughs> Not humans? <laughs> no, bacteria are the dominant life form on Earth. I interrupt this message just briefly because we have a couple of literature lovers out there. Uh, so Hannah and Lexi both love reading, and there were others who mentioned some of that as well. So I want to read to you a sexy-minded passage from one of my very favorite authors, and I challenge you to dive into one of his books. Stephen J. Gould writes in this Planet of the Bacteria a passage about how bacteria are the dominant life form on Earth. On any possible, reasonable, or fair criterion, bacteria are, and always have been, the dominant forms of life on Earth. Our failure to grasp this most evident of biological facts arises in part from the blindness of our arrogance, but also in large me measure as an effect of scale. We are so accustomed to viewing phenomena of our, our scales, sizes measured in feet and ages in decades, as typical of nature. Individual bacteria lie beneath our vision and may live no longer than the time I take to eat lunch or my grandfather spent with his evening cigar. But then, who knows? To a bacterium, human bodies might appear as widely dispersed, effectively eternal, or at least geological, massive mountains fit for all forms of exploitation and fraught with little danger. I love that passage. Not only does it talk to the dominance of bacteria as a life form on Earth, but it also 
even before we had started speaking about the human microbiome, it really is like Stephen Jay Gould was seeing the future of the human body as a planet and the little niches in which the bacteria, the mountains fraught for exploitation, um, are the little ecosystems of our, of our human body planet. <laughs> and in fact, we have cultured and characterized less than 1% of the bacterial world. So this world is full of unknown characters, many of which we're just beginning to elucidate uh, in a genetic way, finding some of their DNA, but not still being able to grow them and to know what they, what, what they need in order to sustain their pure culture growth. Now, it has been traditional that bacteria and archaea are referred to collectively as the prokaryotes. So you've probably talked in your previous courses about the eukaryotes versus the prokaryotes. My challenge question to you this semester is to think about whether or not the term prokaryote is even appropriate. Should we have it? Because bacteria are very different from archaea, which are very different from eukarya. Archaea are related to both bacteria and eukarya and have features of each. Thus, the term prokaryotes collectively referring to bacteria and archaea might be questioned in its appropriateness because in many ways all it does is to say not one of us, right? So I want you to think about this and I want you to go back to it and at the very end of the semester I'm hopeful that you will be able to tell me whether or not you think the term prokaryote should be retained. That being said, I am going to tell you about a nuance of spelling um, this is this is not so if I ever spell prokaryotes with a C instead of a K it's not because I don't know how to spell which is sometimes true as well but it's because that is an alternative spelling you may see in textbooks either a C or a K used so that's something that's important to keep in mind and speaking of nomenclature and how we correctly write about the microbial world we name bacteria using a binomial system of nomenclature binomial two names, a first name and a last name. These names are a genus name and a species name. Both of these names are underlined or italicized. This is commonly done incorrectly. In fact, in a moment, we're going to look at a news article in which they have neither italicized nor underlined a scientific name. They're wrong. They're incorrect. When you all do this, I want you to challenge yourselves to think about always either underlining or italicizing the names. When you're working on a computer, you would use italicization. If you're working on the chalkboard, for example, you would just go ahead and, and underline. So here's the first name, the genus name. And a good example is E. coli. That is Escherichia coli. You might think, well, where does that genus name come from? Turns out it comes from the man who discovered this bacterium. His name was Theodore Ischerich, so his last name was the root for the genus name. Now, today, by the, the um, system of standing nomenclature, we are no longer allowed to name bacteria after ourselves. So if I discover a bacterium, I can't call it the Rachel, the Rachelia, because, <laughs> um, because for one thing, that would just sound really bad. But for another, it's not allowed. But at the time of Theodore Ischerich, he was able to name the bacterium after himself. We now have oftentimes better and more appropriate names. For example, in a moment I'm going to show you a picture of a bacterium called thiomargarita. Well, the thio refers to its ability to utilize sulfur, and that's a much more fitting and appropriate name. So it often comes from the name of the discoverer. The second name, coli, is the species name. And this one is very uh, helpful because it tells you from where an organism is isolated. Coli is the colon. Okay, so the intestine, and this is a GIT bacterium. So this is showing us where, from where that organism was isolated. The one that I just told you about, Thiomargarita, the genus name, its species name is Namibiensis. So you might think that it was isolated in Namibia, right? And it actually was. We'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. So the genus name is commonly abbreviated, and you'll get that feeling because you've probably never heard of E. coli called Escherichia coli. In fact, it almost always goes by its abbreviated name. So E. period coli is the name that we typically see for this bacterium. 
this abbreviation is appropriate and it's accurate. However, it should never be used the first time that you refer to a bacterium. So if you're writing a paper and you mention Escherichia coli for the first time, you should write out the genus name first. And then the next, the subsequent times that you use it, you can say E period coli, and that's appropriate. Now, this, these aren't the only names for a bacterium, a first and last name, so to speak, that is a genus and a species name. But in fact, we, we often need to differentiate. Uh, I remember at one point I was um, talking to one of my students and she called home to tell her mom that she was working with Escherichia coli in the lab, E. coli. And her mom really freaked out. She was like, oh my God, you're working with that terrible pathogen. Well, the E. coli that we work with in the lab is completely non-pathogenic. Now, I don't suggest this, but you could lick a plate of our E. coli and you would not get sick because it is a non-pathogenic laboratory strain. However, if you were working with E. coli 0157H7, that strain is highly pathogenic. It is the acid-tolerant bacterium that sometimes is found in hamburger. So when we think about strain designation, it's important often to relate that strain, and often we will put that after the, the species name. So we'll say E. coli K12, for example, which is a laboratory strain of E. coli or E. coli B, or we'll say E. coli 0157H7, and I'm actually going to jot that down, because that is the very pathogenic strain. So E. coli 0157H7 is one that we will never work with in our lab. Okay, I'm trying to underline it there, so that's clear. E. coli 0157H7. And make note that that is a 1 right there. Excellent. Now, this is a, a perfect segue to look at a newspaper article that will allow us to see what they have done wrong with the binomial system of nomenclature. I've chosen this particular article for Bethany, who has a very strong interest in facials, and there were several other of you, others of you who mentioned that you have an interest in skin and thinking about skin infections. So I picked this particular article because Staphylococcus aureus is a common uh, bacterium that causes skin infections. However, people don't realize that this um, particular microorganism is actually a normal flora in many people. It actually lives on and in us but it also can cause food poisoning. So Staphylococcus aureus, in this case, this is a food safety news uh, headline, Staphylococcus aureus food poisoning, um, and it is incorrect nomenclature. So we're going to take a moment to make the needed corrections on this. So firstly, we can see that they have improperly capitalized the species name. This should be a lowercase a. Additionally, we recognize that this headline is not italicized or underlined, so in the case of both the genus and the species name, we understand that that should in fact be underlined, and really in this case it should have been italicized using the computer. Additionally, as we look through the rest of this warning staff found in Stone Meadow Farm raw milk cheese, um, <laughs> I have opinions about this, but again, this is incorrect. So this should be Staphylococcus aureus, because really staph doesn't indicate anything about the identity of the bacterium, uh, except for maybe in a minute we'll see its arrangement. So that being said, there are a lot of articles out there that don't do this correctly, so it's important to be an educated consumer of the news. I am super jazzed to be introducing you to someone very special. This is Norbert, and Norbert is going to be a part of many of our future conversations. You can see that Norbert is a bacterial cell, but moreover, Norbert is a great example of a very large rod, so a bacillus, a uh, bacillus-shaped bacterium. And you can also see that Norbert just recently got himself a sweet new flagellum. One of my prior students, her name was Isla. She's an amazing woman and she took this to the machine shop and she made it so that Norbert's flagellum would rotate essentially uh, freely. So she made some vast improvements to the overall motility of our beautiful bacillus-shaped cell.
So we have two primary bacterial cell shapes, the caucus or sphere and the bacillus or rod. One of my prior students made me some sweet giant stuffed microbes um, and you can see that this one is designed to be a caucus. <laughs> she did her best. But what's really cool in the world of cocci is that they form, they're likely to form arrangements, specific arrangements based upon the number of planes in which they divide. So for example, you might get a microorganism that forms a diplo arrangement, so two of them side by side, and this diplo arrangement is common within the Neisseria species, so Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, at one point I had a student who was a TA, and he, um, this was actually a long, long time ago, uh, shortly after the bioterrorist scares as they followed 9-11, and um, his brother worked for the courthouse, and his brother had received a package in the mail that was filled with wet paper towels. So my student thought, I'm going to be Sherlock Holmes. And he brought, <laughs> he brought his um, wet paper towels into the lab, streaked them out onto a blood auger plate, and grew them up and stained them. And I didn't even know any of this was going on until he showed me the stain in the microscope. And I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, that looks like a gram-negative diplo caucus, which looks like Neisseria. And so, you know, suffice it to say, eventually the CDCs, the Centers for Disease Control, and the FBI got involved. It was crazy. Uh, so that's my story about Neisseria. Um, now, if we were to see these two uh, in a row actually being many in a row, so if we got a few friends here and we started to get this look of beads on a string, this arrangement is typical of a couple of genera, one of them being streptococcus. So you've all heard of strep throat, right? Strep throat or streptococcus pyogenes is the bacterium that causes that, and it is known for its um, arrangement in beads on a string. So in this case, these bacteria are dividing in a single plane, and that's why they get this particular arrangement. Arrangement. Sometimes the beads on a string arrangement is called the strepto arrangement. Now, alternatively, sometimes we see that these will divide in random planes and we'll get what we think of as being like uh, potentially, maybe if I can do it, grape like clusters. So we basically, these are clustering. And then we actually have a, a name for that as well. We call this the staphylo arrangement. So we saw that with our Staphylococcus aureus. Now remember that with all of these arrangements, we recognize that just because they are sometimes referred to as the strepto or the staphylo arrangement, doesn't mean that if an organism has that arrangement, it necessarily is in that genus. It might be in that genus, but there are other genera that form beads on a string. For example, Enterococcus. Enterococcus is known for causing hospital-acquired or nosocomial infections. It also has a beads on a string arrangement. Now, likewise, Micrococcus has a staphylo arrangement, the grape-like clusters. And lastly, um, when we see the uh, four, so let me see if I can use my giant stuffed microbes to show you a tetrad arrangement. So this would be when we had bacteria dividing in two planes. So they've divided in two planes to make a sweet tetrad arrangement. Now this particular arrangement is actually common in a group of lactic acid bacteria. Um, remember those fermentation bacteria that I love so much? One type of bacterium that's involved in fermentations, one type of lactic acid bacterium, is called Pediococcus acidolastici, and it forms those beautiful tetrads like that. Now I don't have eight giant stuffed microbes, but if I did, I could show you that if we then mirrored that tetrad and had a second packet of eight, then we would see that this would be called sarcina. And in fact, there is a genus called sarcina as well. So packets of eight or division in um, three separate planes, we would see our sarcina uh, arrangement.
Now if we look over to our bacilli, we'll notice that there are some derivations of the bacillus arrangement. For example, sometimes you get these rods that are so short and fat that they kind of almost look like a caucus. So they're cocobacilli, very fittingly. Now I actually do have one of the giant stuffed microbes that one of my students made um, does look like, I would call this a cocobacillus. I mean, look at that thing. It's kind of got a bacillus shape, but yet it kind of looks like a caucus. It's, you know, cocobacillus. And then we can also see half moon shaped organisms. These are vibrios. You're actually going to work with a bacterium in the genus Vibrio. It's a bioluminescent bacterium that lives in a symbiotic relationship with an ocean dwelling squid. So you can look forward to that. But this half moon shaped, uh, or, you know, sort of, um, it's a, a derivation on a rod is really unique. Spirilla also very unique, so they actually look like spirals a, a bit, and these are what we see of certain photosynthetic water-dwelling bacteria. And lastly, perhaps my favorite, are the spirochetes. The spirochetes look like corkscrews. They also move like corkscrews, and while many of them are just non-pathogenic, say, mud dwellers, um, but some of them are pathogenic, and one of the most famous, or the most famous, of the spirochetes is Treponema pallidum. Now wait for it, I've got Treponema pallidum here, and uh, this little, ah, oh, it's the cutest giant stuff microbe ever. Um, Treponema pallidum is the causative agent of syphilis. <laughs> so if <laughs> those of you doing microbiology go want to find a cool museum piece that shows someone suffering from syphilis, I think that would be an interesting thing. So you notice that the corkscrew uh, movement of this bacterium, so as it moves like a corkscrew, it allows it to move effectively through very viscous mud, if it's a uh, earth-dwelling uh, spirochete, or through a very viscous tissue when it's causing disease. So treponema pallidum. So we recognize that these are sort of the generalized shapes that we see within the bacterial world, but we also can see other shapes such as those that change. You, you will all be working with unknowns this semester in lab, and one of the unknowns that some of you will get when we do it the second time is a shape shifter. So uh, those of you who love reading fantasy and sci-fi might be kind of interested to see that bacteria can shift their shape, and archaea as well. So there are some archaea that shift their shape based on temperature. So if they're at a lower temperature, they might be a rod. If they're at a higher temperature, they might be a caucus. Or their age, and the one we'll work with in lab, if it's a fresh culture, then it is, uh, then it is very much rod versus more spherical when it's old. There are also some bacteria bacteria and archaea that literally are shaped like stars. They have what are called prosthesia, which are the, the projections that come out of the cell and allow them to look almost like star shapes. In some cases, uh, for example, a very famous bacterium called Colobacter crescentis actually forms one prosthesia that becomes something called a stalk that allows it to adhere to a surface, and so then it sends its cell up and it can hold onto a surface, and in aquatic environments, it holds really tight. In fact, it's called a holdfast, and it lets it weather the buffering water going by, say, in a stream environment. So form fits function, right? And these shapes show the diversity um, across the microbial world. Um, bacteria range in their size. A as a general rule, we could say that they're smaller than eukaryotic cells, but that's just a generalization because there certainly are some bacteria that are much larger than eukaryotic cells, and likewise there are some tiny eukaryotic organisms. This particular picture on the lower left is of something we've already introduced, Thiomargarita, Thiomargarita namibiensis. It was isolated off the coast of Nabim Namibia in the sandy soil, and you can see that it has internal sulfur storage granules, very fitting to the name Thio. Namibiensis, of course, the species name gives um, elucidates the location that it was isolated. And the crazy thing about this bacterium is that it is huge, 750 micrometers. That is literally almost a thousand times the size of some bacteria. So it is much larger. It is much larger than many than many eukaryotic organisms.
So generalizations in size, you know, bacteria ranging from 0.3 to 2 micrometers, you all will be getting an unknown in lab and you'll be estimating the size of that bacterium. Um, however, we will find that most of your bacteria are on the order of maybe one to five micrometers, nothing like Thiomargarita namibiensis at 750 micrometers. Now, bacteria and archaea reproduce by binary fission. So I want to watch a short video that can be found on TeacherTube that shows how binary fission works. But the long of the short is that bacteria um, literally elongate and they double their contents and then they split, they form a septum that cleaves them off into to two distinct daughter cells. So from one mother cell cleaves to two daughter cells, two daughter cells cleaves to two daughter cells, right? So each daughter cell forms two. Think about the exponential growth that happens there. So this short video, I'm going to narrate it for you. Um, you can also find it on TeacherTube. So bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium dividing every 20 minutes could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. <laughs> Whoa. That's why like when I <laughs> when I think about people saying, "Ah, nothing'll change overnight. Just sleep on it, you know, don't worry about it. Nothing'll change." so wrong. If you've got a bacterial infection, when you think about the doubling rate of bacteria, a lot can change overnight, can it? <laughs> I, I, I like to say it's a lot like working with undergraduates, you know? Um, if, if there's some problem brewing, don't let it go overnight because so much can change. <laughs> think of all the things that can change <laughs> overnight. So, Overarchingly, we can say that a bacterial cell is somewhat simpler in structure than the traditional eukaryotic cell, but of course we're going to find exceptions to every rule. Notice that in, within uh, the bacterial cell, a sort of central region is shown. This is called the nucleoid. The nucleoid is a gel-like mass where the chromosome of the bacterium is stored. The chromosome of a bacterium is a single chromosome, a single circular piece of DNA. It's packaged with uh, protein. And so this is kind of what this like looks sort of like a spaghetti region in the center here of Norbert. Um, but that's what that's showing. Um, we can also see little little pieces of nucleic acid. And in a little bit, we're going to find out that those are called plasmids. Now we also have in here, and I don't know if you guys can see this very well, there's this white kind of globular structure. We're going to talk about something called inclusions, and inclusions are regions uh, that can store or play a role in osmotic balance or buoyancy, and we'll be looking at those in detail. So we're going to be taking our time to zoom in and talk about all of the parts of a bacterial cell. We are actually going to start with the membrane. So notice this region bounding the cell and holding in its internal contents. I want to talk just a little bit about that region first. So that's where we'll go now.